We begin tonight a series in the study of the Psalms, a psalm at a time on Sunday nights, and uh, we'll have some breaks interspersed there. Our plan is not to go all the way to Psalm 150, but to uh, take a stab at the first 50 Psalms consecutively. Uh, We may take a break in there and then do another 50 some point after that. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1, and we'll catch the introduction to this songbook of Israel. It has become the songbook of the church, the songbook of God's people in all ages. And we'll begin our study of the Psalms by looking at this first Psalm. Recently, my family and I hiked Mount Lemmon. Uh, We drove to the top, and we descended down a trail, and we came to a fork in the trail. There were Two paths diverging in a wood. It wasn't a wood. It was just a rocky outcrop with some cactus. Two roads diverged in the middle of that. And one of those roads went back to the parking lot where our vehicle was, where the cold, refreshing drinks waited for us in a cooler. And the other path descended some 6,500 feet to the desert floor outside of Tucson. It sure would have been nice as we addressed that fork in the road to know the destination of each of those paths. Would have been nice to know this path leads to cold drinks in the parking lot. And this path leads to meandering aimlessly down the mountain. Experience has told us that it would have been nice to know the end from the beginning. We discovered Rather unfortunately, that we took the wrong fork in the road. It, uh, it cost us some. There's a fork in the road of your life this evening. Right before you, there are two paths that diverge from this fork in your road. And the destination of one of those paths is happiness. And the destination of the other path is the misery of eternal destruction. One path is the way of blessedness and life in God, and the other path is the very undoing of life, and it terminates in eternal judgment from God. At their divergence, these two paths may seem close to one another. Uh, They may, for much of their mileage, even seem similar to each other in this life. But eternity will show just how far these paths diverge, and the contrast could not be greater Let's look together at the roadmap for the two paths of life. Let's read together Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and on his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. This psalm is the introduction to the psalms. Derek Kidner has called it the doorkeeper for the psalms. Joel James called it the gateway into the psalms. It is psalm number one, and in our canon of Scripture, it is at the beginning, at the heading of this songbook in our Bible. The word psalms simply means praises, And in our study of the Psalms, we will encounter praise and lament and instruction and imprecation and wisdom and petition, enthronement and prophecy. And while a great portion of the Psalms is indeed lament, the theme of the Psalms in all of its various aspects is that God is God and it is praise for God woven throughout the Psalms. There is a tension embedded in this songbook. The tension is that things are not right yet. But God is God and He is to be praised. 
If we summarize the theme of the whole Bible this way, the glory of God as king in salvation and judgment. I would suggest to you that's the theme of the whole Bible. The glory of God as king in both salvation and in judgment. Then we might summarize the theme of Psalms this way, praise to God as king, both in his salvific acts and in his acts of judgment. The book of Psalms was designed by God to be a songbook for the people of God. And each one of the songs that we'll encounter was written from a particular situation. And yet they've been assembled for general use. They were to be sung by Israel. They were to be sung by the people of God as they gathered together. They were to be placed on the heart and, and sung as the individual worshiper took these words before God. Written by an individual songwriter from a very specific purpose. Sometimes we know the historical setting of the song. Sometimes we don't. But intended by God for general use. The Psalms in their poetry give a fitting expression to the entire panoply of emotions that we experience as humans. And so you have probably gravitated to the Psalms. You've probably picked out some favorite Psalms. Uh, perhaps you sing them in the shower. Perhaps you've memorized some and think about them often. We will find that many of these songs will find their most fitting expression in the millennial kingdom when the king himself will reign on the earth. Some of the Psalms that we'll study just leave you hanging. Okay, I, I think that's supposed to be true, but it's not true yet. When do we really get to sing this? There's an anticipation of the future. Many of the songs express our experiences here in the turmoil of a God-cursed universe, of a sin-filled world, a, a world of tension and turmoil and pain, a world that is not rightly submitted to His reign yet. And so we praise, we petition, we lament, along with the people of God from every age. The Psalms are illustrative, they're evocative, they're emotional, they're personal, they're set in poetry that is highly illustrative. They strike chords with our manifold personal experiences. We relate to the songwriters. They cry out for help from difficult situations. They are moved by the splendor and glories of creation. They sing about historical res rescues from danger. They sing about the past faithfulnesses of God. And they appeal on the basis of God's past rescues to hope for future rescues. And we anticipate with the songwriters the glories of those perfections to come when all will be made right. We will even learn from this songbook what it means to take God's side against the enemies of His Messiah. And Psalm 1 introduces us to the entirety of this songbook. As the gatekeeper for the Psalms, it is a wisdom psalm. That is, it's rightly part of wisdom literature. It's a song portraying the contrast between godly living on the one hand and wicked living on the other. And so it sets the stage for how we should view all of the Psalms. There are only two paths in life. There is the path of the godly and there is the path of the ungodly. It also sets the stage for how we should approach all of life. In the Hebrew text, the first word of Psalm 1 is the word blessed. The first word of Psalm 1 is blessed. The first word of the Psalms as a book is blessed. And the word blessed simply means happy. And in the Hebrew here, it is plural. And, and it has some emphasis, something like, how happy, surely how happy is the man who... There's a theology in this for us. When God set out a book that was to be a songbook for his people to render praises to him, the first thing he says about how to live life and how to worship him is, you're happy if you. God is a good God. And he desires the blessing and happiness and divine favor to be upon his people. And that happiness and divine favor, the enviable life, is available to those who will orient themselves on God's path rather than on the path of the wicked. 
So what we see in Psalm 1, this wisdom psalm that opens up the book of Psalms for us, are these two divergent paths of life contrasted. This is our fork in the road. There is a path called happiness, and there is a path that is the undoing of all happiness. And these two paths could not be more different. And two paths are described here because there are only two. There is no third category. There is no alternate route. There is no middle road. You are on God's path or you are not. And listen, it's really helpful to see both paths and the destinations of both paths from the fork in the road. It's the opportunity for us to see the map in the big picture. Listen, friends, you are privileged to be here tonight and to have this map of your life laid out by divine revelation. God is here in his word to show you there are two ways to live. And one of them ends in death and the other is the path of life. Let's look first of all at the path of the godly. This is laid out for us in the first three verses. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. This is the roadmap For a godly life, it is the path of happiness. You want to be happy, you get on this path. That is the promise of this psalm. The word blessed here is is just simply to be privileged, to be receiving of divine favor. And this is for, first of all, we see the man who does not do certain things. Followed by a description of the man who does do certain things with the result So we're going to look at what the godly man does not do, what the godly man does do, and then what is the result in his life? Look first in verse 1 at what the godly man does not do. The blessed man, the happy man, is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. And even in the English uh, text, this poetic lilt comes through. You, you can hear the, the sing-songy parallelism of this beautiful Hebrew poetry. These are not three synonymous statements, three different ways, maybe colorful ways to say the exact same thing. These are rather overlapping ideas in a progressive parallelism. There is a walking, a standing, and a sitting. There is a a counsel, and a way, and a seat. And there are the wicked, the sinners, and the scoffers. And each of these three categories give us descending degrees of the degradation of depravity. Designed to demonstrate for us something of the downward spiral of what happens when man is committed to rebellion against God. These are degrees of descending degradation. This is a progress in departure from God and his ways. Notice the word counsel, first of all, in verse 1. Counsel is just a word that conveys ideas, words, worldview, concepts. The word path in verse verse 1 is the word for way. It is the very common word word describing a way of life. It is a a word for a literal path or metaphorically a way of walking, a customary way of living. It is your lifestyle, uh, the habitual way you go about living. And then the word seat in verse one is a place of authority, a place of teaching. It is, it is the location where someone with authority sits down and dispenses the ideas that one is fully loyal to. You want people to hear your voice. You want them to hear what you're saying. You're committed to these ideas. You want others to follow your lead. And notice in verse 1, the counsel here is described as the counsel of the wicked. That is, the ideas, the worldview, the topics of conversation, the interests, the thoughts, the priorities, the words of those who are in rebellion against God. 
What is the path of happiness? What is the life of the godly man? First of all, he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And notice the the pathway in verse 1 is the pathway of sinners. That is the customary way of living for those whose lives are contrary to God. And the idea of the righteous versus the sinners here are categories of identity. It, it's not particularly about behavior, although it results in behavior. We're talking about two different kinds of people on the earth on two different paths. And we're not talking about the, the righteous being those who have never sinned. Any more than we're, we're talking about the, the sinners as being the, the worst they possibly could be. But the righteous here are those who are categorically oriented toward God by faith. And as we understand this de- designation from the rest of Scripture, this righteousness is a righteousness by grace that comes through faith. It is not a self-righteousness. It is not a bootstrapped morality. You do the best you can and God calls it righteousness. No, what did God say to Abraham? He believed God and God credited it as righteousness. And what do the righteous do? The, the righteous don't sit on a declaration of justification by faith unchanged. Those who are righteous by faith actually live out a growing practical righteousness before the Lord. That's the category of people that are described here. And likewise, those who are sinners are categorical sinners who have not been rescued. They are still on the path to destruction. They are on the same path all of us started on. And they are in their rebellion against God. They are in a customary way of living contrary to God and His ways. And then notice the seat of scoffers. This is not just any old authoritative place of teaching. This is the the, the teaching seat of those who are farthest down the path of rebellion against God in this triad of sinners. The scoffer is the mocker of God, the one who is mocking truth. He He pokes fun at ultimate realities like heaven and hell and holiness and grace. In his arrogance, he he has no place for these things in his life. He derides God and he derides the people of God. He sets himself up as judge over how to live, how to think. The seat of scoffers is the place of propaganda. It is the philosopher waxing eloquent as an authoritative teacher of rebellion against God. He is antagonistic to the truth, and he he wants others to hear his thoughts and follow his lead. And so what the godly man does not do, the godly man on the path to happiness, he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Think about that for a moment. There's an implicit command here for those who follow God to mind your influences. Be aware of your influences. You are being counseled all the time. Did you know that? There is a competition for your thoughts, for your mind, for your loyalties. Teachers, friends, peers, podcasts, movies, music, social media, news feeds. You have a thousand counselors all around you all the time. And they are speaking freely. And if you live in this world... More often than not, those counselors are the wicked. They're opposed to God. They are not on His path. They don't think with His priorities. They're not consumed with His glory. They are not living for the next life. Have you chosen your counselors intentionally? Have you just haphazardly slipped into listening to a thousand errant voices? Have you discerned what path your counselors are on? You are being taught all the time. You're being influenced all the time. Without even trying, you may very well be walking in the counsel of the wicked. The path to happiness, the the godly man, is also described negatively as not standing in the path of sinners. That is, he is choosing not to just hang out amidst the way of life of those rebelling against God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. You know how this works. You gravitate in thought and behavior to the people around you. 
When I was in junior high school, all the cool kids were wearing BKs. You have to be really old to know what a BK is. It's not Burger King. British Knights, they were the shoe. By the time I got around to affording a pair of British Knights, nobody was wearing them anymore. I felt the influence. I wanted to be like the people around me. I wanted to dress like they did. I, I wanted to listen to the gangster rap that they listened to. I did so secretly with headphones so my parents didn't know what it was. I wanted to talk like they talked. It is so natural for us to conform to those around us. That is the way society works. And if you're not intentional about your influences, if you're not careful about the path, the way, the way of life, the lifestyle that you're around, you will be influenced by it. Right? The New Testament way to describe this is Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. That is, do not be squeezed into the mold of this world. It's the same prohibition here. Aberrant behavior feels normal when our friends are doing it. Do you understand this phenomenon? If you've never seen some form of aberrant behavior, you go, who would ever do that? But then if you have a friend who's participating in something aberrant, you say, well, I guess that's just normal. Entertainment works the same way. And this is the way aberrant behavior infiltrates a society. Literature, movies, music normalize aberrancy so that it feels normal and not so shocking anymore. We are like frogs in a kettle. The temperature just goes up slightly more and more and more and we don't realize it until, until we're boiled. Notice he also does not sit in the seat of scoffers. He's not making his home, his habitation in this place of farthest rebellion in this triad. The seat of scoffers is not passively being around a godless worldview. The, the seat of scoffers is, is not like, that's the first category. The seat of scoffers is not like the second category, the, the sort of lifestyle conformity when in Rome do as the Romans do. The seat of scoffers is the active propagation of rebellious ideas. This is the atheist philosopher. This is the one who is personally antagonistic against the God who made him. And he is setting his seat to loose venom from his troubled life in scoffing intellectual tirades. Spurgeon described the seat of the scoffer this way. The seat of the scoffer may be very lofty. But it is very near the gate of hell. Let us flee from it, for it soon shall be empty, and destruction shall swallow up the man who sits therein. So the godly man on the path of happiness avoids the ideas, avoids the way of life, avoids the rebellious intellectualism of the world surrounding him. That is what the godly man does not do. We see in verse 2 what the godly man does do. Look down at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And in his law he meditates day and night. Law here is just the word for instruction. And it's a word that could describe one instruction or a set of instructions. Or the instructions that are all of God's word. And that is what is intended here in Psalm 1. All of God's word, the Bible. His delight is in God's word. And delight is such a good word here. During COVID, many of you lost the sense of taste. When I first lost my sense of taste, I was drinking a cherry Coke. And it tasted like automobile gasoline. I thought something was wrong with the Coke. Something was actually wrong with me. I have been sick recently, and good coffee tastes bad. It's a tragedy. Can you imagine what eating would be like if you had no taste buds? Or if you had taste buds that made everything taste bad? Without enjoyment. Listen, we'd all be skinny, and it would not be good. 
Sustaining our bodies would be like going to the gas pump for your car. Do you enjoy going to the gas station? I mean, listen, it's, it's inconvenient. No, that's right, you don't. It's inconvenient, it's costly, it's unpleasant, and it is necessary. Imagine if you're eating, sustaining your body, getting food was all of those things. This is really an unpleasant experience. Let's just get it over with. It costs too much. It takes time. But God graciously gave us taste buds so that at some level, eating would be delightful. The godly man on the path of happiness delights in the word of God. It tastes good to him. He savors the flavor of the very words of God. It's not a task for him. It's not a chore for him. It's not some sort of inconvenience. He wants to hear from God and his word because it is a delight for him (coughs) to know the heart of God, to allow the thoughts of God to be his rest, his comfort, his correction, and his help. I am so sorry about that. I should not have sung. I shouldn't have sung this morning. I shouldn't have sung this evening. And the thing that comes with the delight in God's word is that obedience readily follows. The godly man who delights in God's word is not there first and foremost to get information. He's not there first and foremost to fill his mind with facts. I love the words of my wife. It's not first and foremost because of the information she may or may not dispense. Though Those things can be important. I love her words because they belong to her. They reveal her mind and her heart, who she is to me in verbal form. The godly man delights in God's word because the words of God reveal God. In his words, we get to know him. We, we, we get his heart, we get his mind. We love the word of God because we love him. And notice what the happy man does. He meditates on the word of God day and night, verse two. This word meditate is, is uh, just a wonderful word. If you think about a cow with four stomachs and the way a cow digests its food, maybe you'd rather not think about an animal with four stomachs. But a cow takes food in and begins to digest it in a stomach and then regurgitates it back into its mouth and chews it. We talk about a cow chewing the cud. Uh, This was a a really important word to me that my 1967 Mustang had a license plate on it, Cud 491, Texas. I just love the word cud. And it was from high school a reminder to me about what meditation is supposed to be like. Like a cow chews cud, we are to take God's word in, regurgitate it back up, chew on it some more, digest it some more, bring it back up, chew on it a little bit more. This is totally different than the the check-off-the-box devotional time. I have to read the Word of God because Robert Murray McShane told me I had to. Check it off, got it done, task over, move on with my life. That, That is not the way of happiness. There is a discipline in Bible reading. I will confess to you, I wake up in the morning and I don't feel like reading my Bible. Confess that to Lord. God, I'm not delighting in your word from the heart right now. That's not right. Help me. Read until I'm reading. Uh, Discipline until I'm delighting. There's a place for that. Don't neglect the word of God. Oh, Matt, you are wonderful. Thank you. don't wait for delight to kick in to start reading the Word of God, right? Sometimes we get into a a, a vicious cycle of, well, I don't feel like reading the Word of God, and I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I won't read the Bible. Uh, That's not the right approach. Meditate on it day and night. Delight will come. Seek Him. Confess when you don't delight. 
This word for meditate comes from a, a Hebrew word that means to mutter or to murmur. And you get the idea of the, the godly man, his lips are moving, and what's happening in his lips is he's just talking under his breath to himself. The word of God. He, he's muttering and, and mumbling it. That means he's taking it in, he's repeating it, he's reviewing it, he has memorized it, and he is pondering it over and over. To meditate on the word of God would be to sing the word of God, to pray the word of God, to, to take it in and think about it throughout the day. And, and notice the time frame here is day and night. Not your devotional time in the morning, but take in God's word and think about it throughout the day. What does that look like practically? Uh, a three by five card nailed to your rear view mirror in your car. Uh, note cards taken with you to work, uh, regurgitating what you read that morning to somebody else because what you give away, you tend to keep, talk about it with others. Uh, there are a lot of different methodologies to thinking about God's word throughout the day. That is what the godly man does. Have you ever read a text of scripture one time and then moved on and, and thought, oh, I didn't get anything out of that? Uh, there are a couple of ways to, a, to approach a pond. Uh, a flat stone skipped across the surface, or scuba gear. I'm going to suggest scuba gear. <laughs> Jump in, dive deep, and stay there a while. You will see far more when you do it that way. Are movie quotes a part of your lingo? You have a favorite movie, they've got some great lines, and then just what comes out when you want to say something, you, you take the words from that favorite movie and they just come out and, and they lend rich expression to what you want to say. Maybe your vocabulary is filled with pop culture illusions. What would your life look like if you delighted in the law of Yahweh and you meditated on it day and night? Uh, would phrases from scripture just pour out in your common conversation. It's a good indication of, of what you think about all the time. Look at the result in verse 3 of the godly man and his commitment. He will be like a tree planted, really planted, seriously planted, intentionally planted, purposefully planted. My translation says firmly planted by streams of water. The tree yields its fruit in its season, its leaf doesn't wither, and whatever he does, the man prospers. It's a remarkable picture, a tree that has been purposefully planted, where? Near streams of water that provide nourishment, and, and the result is fruit and vitality and prosperity. Arizona, in some ways, as a dry climate, gives us a good picture of what the psalmist would be seeing. If you go around to the various creeks and rivers in Arizona, especially in the, the lower desert areas, you, you can see sycamores and oak trees. How are they growing in the middle of the desert? Well, they are planted by streams of water, and it's dry all around. There are rocks and dead grasses and thorny desert plants, and then there's those skeletons of trees that tried to grow because some rain fell for a little while and a tree sprouted up, and now it's totally dead and gone. But these trees, with roots sunk into these flowing streams, flourish their roots are tapped into cool, consistent sources of water, and they thrive in the desert. That's the picture here. It's like the picture of John 15. Jesus said, abide in me, and if you don't abide in me, you can't do anything. You might say, well, I want to be stable in life. I want to flourish. I want fruit and vitality and prosperity. But you know, I don't really feel like reading my Bible. I don't really care to examine my entertainment choices. I don't want to do the work of monitoring my inputs and filtering my counselors and scrutinizing my influences. Then I would suggest to you, friend, that you don't truly want to be happy. You are choosing, therefore, not to be on the path that actually leads to happiness. According to the roadmap we have here in Psalm 1, if you want to be happy, you will be a man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, and you will be the man who delights in the law of Yahweh and meditates on it day and night. That's the map. That's the path. If you want to be happy, you must avoid the so-called wisdom of the world, and you must soak your heart in the word of God. What does that look like? Daily Bible reading, 
Maybe you're a listener to an audio Bible. Listen, most of the world in its history has been illiterate and has had to memorize scripture by audibly taking it in. We have such amazing treasures in the written word of God and so many copies and the ability to read. To whom much is given, much will be expected. It means memorizing scripture, rehearsing scripture, regurgitating scripture, singing and praying scripture. It means sitting under Bible teaching and Bible preaching. Sometimes we hear the complaint in an equipping style church. Man, there's a lot of teaching around here. Man, that's a lot of sermons I'm expected to listen to. Uh, Don't we have enough teaching? And sometimes that's leveled as a complaint. Sometimes perhaps with the, the, the genuine desire of, I want to apply everything that I hear in the sermon and make sure that my obediences are up to par with what has been preached before I hear another sermon. <laughs> I think that's perhaps well-intentioned but short-sighted. You and I don't know what we're going to need tomorrow. So take in all the Bible you can. But I would just ask, if you've heard that complaint or if you've leveled that complaint, have you done the math? What is it like to sit for an hour under God's word one, two, three times a week? Three hours, one day has 24. I know you have to sleep some, refuel some, go to work, do some other things, but three out of 24, multiply that by seven. In a given week, how much input do you have And how much is that input in competition with, say, three hours of sitting under God's word? I think we're probably shorting the Bible here. I don't know that there's a place for us to complain, oh, there's too much teaching, too much Bible reading. Frankly, just from a time standpoint, we're not yet competing with the thousand counselors that scream for our attention in a given week. Have you done the math on your entertainment choices? Over and against inputs from the word of God. I just don't think we're we're liable to be so Bible saturated that we become ineffective and worthless. I, I think we're probably more on the level of starving our spirits. I think we can still grow in this area. I'm not suggesting more sermons necessarily. But I am saying what we do get in a given week has a lot to compete with in the school classroom, in our recreation, um, in just the way we walk through this life. The second path is detailed for us in the last three verses of the psalm. The wicked are not so. The wicked are not what? Um, The wicked are not like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. They're not fruitful in season. They, their leaves do wither, and, and in what they do, they're frustrated, not prosperous. Everything you read in verse 3 is contradicted in verse 4. The wicked are not like what we just discovered. They're, they're on the wrong path. They're not on the path to happiness. They're, they're not under the blessing of God. However, they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. If you're a, a farmer in possession of a grain field, you, you may be aware of what chaff is. Uh, the farmers would take the grain and, and they'd put it on the threshing floor and they'd pulverize all the material there, either with a threshing sledge, uh, animal hooves, some other heavy implement that would just sort of smash everything up. And, and the edible grains would, would fall out among all the other stuff that's not edible. And the threshing floors in Israel were on high hills where they would be approached by the the breezes in the afternoon. And so the the farmer would take the the pitchfork to the grain and he would just start throwing everything up into the air. And the breeze would take away the chaff, the, the worthless light material. And the heavy grains would fall down. Uh, we, we have some of these ideas still in our language. You know what a threshold is. The, the threshold is that, that barrier in a room over which the door is. The, the, the threshold held the thresh. It was like a, a raised area at the border of a room outside the door. And so people could go in and out of the door, but the threshold would hold the thresh in. 
So we still have some of these ideas. Uh, For me, the idea of chaff is more closely related to coffee roasting. And if you roast coffee, you're familiar with chaff. For me, I don't have uh, large animals uh, trudging out coffee beans. I just have a couple of colanders and a fan. And then after the coffee is roasted, I dump the coffee between the colanders and the fan blows the chaff. And if you've been in my backyard, it is just full of the chaff of coffee roasting. And I'll roast about once a week. And so I'm very familiar with chaff. But the chaff blows away easily. Some of the chaff actually gets burned up in my grill where I roast my coffee. And by the time I'm sitting down to a croissant and a cup of coffee, I have totally forgotten about chaff. It's meaningless. It's worthless. It's useless. In the world of agriculture, the the chaff was inevitable. I mean, inevitable. It was inedible. It got blown away easily by the breezes, and whatever the wind couldn't take away, they would gather up together and burn it. The chaff is forgotten. You're not thinking about chaff when you're eating your meal. You you dispense with it. The wind easily takes it away, or it gets burned, and, and you're just done with it. That is what the path of the wicked is like. That is what the man on the path of wickedness is like. Despite outward appearances, what what may appear like a very vibrant life is actually nothing but chaff that will be dispensed easily with the wind of God's judgment and burned up in the fire of His justice. It's just gone. It's, It's worthless. It's easily discarded. It's burned. It has no significance. It is weightless and it is forgotten. I had a neighbor with a fake ficus on his front porch. And monsoon season inevitably would tip the ficus over and blow off fake ficus leaves and blow them into my yard. And it was a really remarkable illustration. From, from outward appearances, you go, okay, there's a nice potted tree on the front porch. It's a phony. It's not rooted in anything. It's not vibrant. It doesn't have real leaves and it has no fruit. And, and when the wind comes, it's just done. That is, that is the wicked man. And we're fooled by outward appearances. We, we look at the ungodly man and we think, oh, what a fruitful, successful life. But look at verse 5. The wicked will not rise in the judgment, nor will sinners rise or stand in the congregation of the righteous. That is, the, the wicked in the end have no standing before God and they have no place with God's people. They're blown away in the justice of God and they're excluded from the society of God's people. They have no path to happiness. They have no path to divine favor. They have been on a path that only leads to destruction. Listen, this is so helpful for us to see the end from the beginning, to get out the map and see where these two paths go. And the divergence in the end is a separation of infinity. Look at verse 6. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is still under the description of the the wicked man's path, the the path to destruction. But but the righteous is brought in here, and this is a tremendous comfort. Yahweh knows. This is the word for intimate relational knowledge. He knows, he cares, he loves his own. And and this knowledge is a knowledge of their way, their life, the, the whole path of the way that they've lived. What does God say about the way of the wicked? It will perish. Proverbs 14, 12 says there is a way, same word, a way that seems right to man, but the end of it is death. We know the converse of that in John 14, 6. Jesus himself said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Listen, this Old Testament description of the way of life, the the path of happiness, the, the road of the godly, this path only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, came to earth and declared, I am the way. You want to know what the way is? What is the way of the godly? What is the the way of the blessed man? It is the way of Jesus. You only get to life through him. 
through his death on the cross to pay for sins, through his resurrection from the grave to prove that his payment for sin was acceptable to God and actually paid for the sins of everyone who would ever believe, through his resurrected life and our union with him, we get life. Notice the last word of verse 6. The way of the wicked will perish. Do you remember why Jesus came, John 3.16? Because God loved this world of sinners. We were all on the wrong path. And he loved this big and wicked world in this way. That he sent his son. To what end? That everyone who believes in him will not perish. But will possess life eternal. Which man are you? Which path are you on? Are you on the path of happiness, divine favor, blessing? Is that characterized in you by a delighting in the law of God? Is it characterized in you by an avoiding of those things antagonistic to God and his ways? Listen, if you are on the right road, if you are the the happy man, you were there only by grace, and we rejoice in that, the grace in the gospel. If you're on the wrong path and you recognize it even this evening, you need to know that you are still on this earth, and there's still a fork in your road, and you may access the path of life through Jesus by faith. Let's pray. God, thank you for this, your word. Thank you for this gateway into this book of songs. Thank you for the wisdom. Thank you for laying out the math, uh, the map for the paths of life and the path of destruction. God, I pray that uh, we would be a people who delight in your word, who meditate on it day and night, who are characterized by knowing your thoughts and thinking your thoughts knowing your heart and being like you in it. God, we ask that you would grow our affections for your word and grant us by your grace that happiness in it you've promised. In Jesus' name, amen.